Hi, I'm Jay John. Welcome to Facing the Canon. I am delighted to welcome my friend, motivational speaker and author, Paul McGee. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you, my dear friend, Professor Paul McGee. Welcome to Facing the Canon. It's, it's absolutely brilliant to finally make it, John. It really is. It's good to be here. Tell us about you. Where were you born, Paul? I'm a Manchester lad, which, and it always concerns me, particularly from working down south and someone says, which part of Liverpool are you from? Yes. As a proud Mancunian, that doesn't help build rapport. But yeah, I was born in Manchester and I live just outside of Warrington and I've, um, I've kind of moved a little bit around the country. We met when I was studying at Bradford University. But when you were 10, Paul, you ran away from home. Yeah, I think what it's... What happened? All right, well, in some ways, some of the people who were involved in that situation are still alive, so I need to be kind of sensitive to that. But let's just say it was a rather dysfunctional childhood. So by the age of nine, I'd had four different father figures. Um, and at the age of 10, I had this grand idea that I would run away from home. It was a cry for help, really, and that I would be missing for a week and I'd pretend I'd been kidnapped and it'd be all in the press. And it was just some fantastical idea. Now, in the end, <clears throat> I was only missing several hours, but it was a cry for help. Yes. Um, yeah, so difficult, difficult dark days, if I'm perfectly yes. honest. But growing up, you didn't feel that you were very academic. And after you took your A-levels, you got a job as a bank clerk. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I was... Um, yeah, and I think sometimes even about, particularly obviously in the UK, if you're a summer child, so I was born in August, I was the second youngest in my year at school. And I don't think that helped in some ways because I'd literally have kids in my class who are almost a year older than me. So I was told you've done incredibly well to get A-levels. I mean, I got I was the first member of our family to ever get an O-level, as they were called then. Yes. Although my pot did blow up in the kiln. So I missed out on pottery O-level, John. I've had therapy. I've got over it. But um, so, yeah, I got my A-levels, but I was told you're not good enough for university. We also had some in the, in the UK in that time called polytechnics. You're not good enough for either of those. So get a job working in a bank, which is what I did. But then your results arrived and they were good enough to go to university. They were. And also combining with no offence to anyone who works in a bank, but I was not cut out to be a bank clerk, let's be honest. And so um, I got my A-level results. I had an interest maybe, particularly in people. Um, and so I went actually a year later, I went to Bradford University and I did a degree which incorporated behav behavioral and social psychology and also trained me to be a probation officer. So after you graduated, you trained to be a probation officer, mm. but then you moved on from that yeah, I didn't feel that probation was quite what I wanted. So I took what was then, it was called personnel management. We call it HR now, human resources. Um, and I was awarded a place on a, a graduate management scheme with Unilever, big multinational. And during this time, did you have a faith? in Jesus? Yeah, I would. So I was brought up, although it was an incredibly dysfunctional family, um, we were, it was a Catholic upbringing. And my metaphor for my faith is it's been a journey and it's been an evolution, if you like. And I was recently thinking about how do you best explain the evolution of faith? And I was, the other day, I was in the bedroom getting ready and I hear Helen, my wife, go, your tea's ready, your tea's ready. And I was thinking that we're in the same house. I'm aware of her presence, but clearly a, pr a true relationship, you've got to be in the same room, so to speak. And so for me, my early days as a child, and my, my, by the age of five, my mum and dad were divorced. And yet I, I would, and by the age of seven or eight, Sadly, because mum got divorced, in a sense, the church at the time rejected her. Um, and I would walk two, two and a half miles to go to church on my own. So I had this, there was this pull 
almost like a gravitational pull. And, and in a sense, in a, in a world of real chaos and dysfunction, my childlike faith in God, I, I probably talk more about God than Jesus at the time, um, kind of was my anchor. But I would still say it was like my, it was a distant love, it was a distant relationship. It's like we're in the same house, but we've never been in the same room. And then over time, there came a point two or three weeks before my 18th birthday where my faith evolved to a point where it was almost like I opened the door to a, and it was suddenly it was a, it was a love that was personal yes. and intimate. And suddenly this presence in the house became a relationship in the room. Yes. If that makes it's sense. It's a great analogy, Paul. No, absolutely. And of course, and since then, you just um, followed the Lord, got to know him. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I am, I'm a, I'm a reader, I'm a thinker. Um, and it's not, and for me, it's not, there's a, a phrase I came across, when you think you've got all the answers, you stop asking questions. And although there is a sense in which I feel I have found an answer, I still wrestle with my faith every single day in a positive way. I, I keep thinking, how do I relate my faith to what I do, to other people, to their worlds, to their issues, to their challenges? Um, and I, I'm constantly on this quest for how do I make my faith relevant? And I would still say I'm on a journey in a relationship, just like I've been married to my wife for nearly 35 years, but I'm not the person I was um, on October the 23rd, 1987, when we said, I do. And we've both evolved and changed. And my faith has evolved and changed, but certainly at the core of my being, that I cannot get away from the impact my faith has had on my world and how I do life. Not always as well as I would like to, but um, I think it's Apostle Paul says in Acts, in him we live and move and have, and have our being. being. Absolutely. And so for me, that is central to all I do. Yeah, you and your wife, Helen, there was an occasion when you walked past a bin that's right, yeah. Well, and did, tell yeah. us the story about that. Yeah, so it was um, a Saturday in March 1993, and the next day was Mothering Sunday. Now, I'm into my football. I said to Helen, all right, we'll go shopping on Saturday as long as I'm back in time for football focus, which started about quarter past 12 on the Saturday. So um, my wife walks past a particular bin, um, and then 10 minutes later, we meet up to go home. And that bin that my wife had walked past when she was eight months pregnant with my first, our first child, Matthew, um, that bin was blown up by the IRA and uh, two children lost their lives. Um, yeah, so. But your powerful. wife had just walked past it. Yeah, a few minutes before. earlier. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite emotional thinking it about it. I don't talk about it a great deal. Yeah, yeah, and to process it, and that it, you, yes, you know. and and I and and a few years earlier, I was in Bradford and was due to go to a football match, and I changed my mind an hour before kick off, um, and that was the Bradford fire. Yeah, lots of people lost their lives at Bradford that day, including a couple of people who were connected with the church I was part of at that time. And um, yeah, it's it, it does shape you. And I think one of the things that I've learned in life is not to take it for granted. No, absolutely. But these incidents do shape us. Sure. But you, um, you became ill. Yes. What happened? How did you, did you notice that you were becoming ill? And what was the effect? How long did it last? Sure. How long did you cope? Sure. So I had in the summer of um, before my wedding, I, I became ill with glandular fever, which recognised illness, impacted me, was very exhausted. Uh, but it lasted around six weeks. I start off my job managing 30 women on the economy beef burger line and this graduate management trainee scheme. 
And then I developed what we just thought was a bit of a virus. This was like a year later from granular fever, but it, e it evolved into, you're not actually getting over this virus. And I was in my mid twenties and um, it was like, well, you should be over this now. And, and I wasn't, and I actually went to the doctor and he said to me, have you heard of an illness called ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis? And I said, actually I have. I said, it gets a bit of a bad press, doesn't it? Some people call it yuppie flu. He said, yes. He said, there's no specific test for it, but we've tested you for everything else. And I actually think that you might have ME. And the metaphor I'd use, if no one's ever heard of it, is sometimes known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Yes. Is if you go to bed at night and you, you basically your phone's dead and you charge it up, in the morning you'll wake up and it'll be on 100%. But for me with my illness, I'd wake up in the morning and it was the equivalent of I'm on 5%, maybe 10%. And the nature of the illness was I would actually improve and relapse, improve and relapse. So I never knew if I was gonna get over the illness. So living with uncertainty, living with faith, which was like, why is this happening? Living with a belief that, well, maybe I'm gonna be uh, uh, dramatically healed. But that didn't happen. And I had to at one stage, which again, people might go, well, as a Christian, you lacked faith. But I at one stage just go, had to say, I have to accept I have this illness. And I would have some good days and bad days. And as I say, would improve and relapse. Um, and so it was over three years. And even then, because I knew I would sometimes improve, but then relapse, it was another five to six years of living with that constant uncertainty will you have another relapse? So I went from I went from being one of only four graduates that Unilever took on that year to specialise in HR. So one of four in the whole of the UK. And a week later, I was on what they then called invalidity benefit. Yes. So I was labelled an invalid. And I'll tell you what, words change worlds. And that became, on one level, my identity. So it was a challenge. But you got through that season. I did. I did. Yes. But that season, you weren't able to work. No, no. There no. Was, I had a walking stick. There were days I couldn't walk twenty yards without collapsing. Occasionally, not often, but so I was so weak to sometimes lift my hands. Helen, my wife, would be newly married. Only been married just over a year. Would wa wash me. Uh, fortunately, didn't have to do that too much. It was hard. We didn't have food banks at that time. But my mum and my mother-in-law. Um, would sometimes just come round with, you know, we, we lived, we we're okay, Helen worked, but it wasn't easy, but they'd come round with food parcels for us. It was an incredibly humbling experience. You got through that storm. How did you start working? Yeah. I love the story. Well, I, you, you, you interviewed yourself. Yeah, because what happened, John, when you've had this illness that some people think doesn't exist, they got to the point where the, the, re, the relapses were less severe. And I'm thinking, I'm going to try and get a job, but just part time. But I couldn't get a job doing anything because I couldn't pass a medical. So as I say, so what did I do? I, I hired myself. I was amazing in the interview. Standout <laughs> candidate. Yes. Even passed my own medical. And that was, that was now 31 years ago. And again, not an amazing start. I think in my first 12 months, I, I turned over just over £2,000. I paid no tax, no national insurance, and basically my accountant sacked me. It was like, you're a waste of time, really. Um, so again, not the most auspicious of starts, but I'd been on invalidity benefit anyway, so I didn't get much money, so I didn't see an impact financially, but I was being kept by Helen in many respects. But then things began to turn around, not dramatically, but slowly. And it's been quite a journey since then. And then of course you you progressed and started to use your skills, yeah. your learning. Yeah. And when did you know that you were going to commence what you're currently doing? I got involved with a, a company. I, so people fascinate me. I have no interest in technology, machinery, people fascinate me and i'd in some respects john I'd, I'd seen what you were doing and i remember thinking i i wasn't great at sport at school but when it came to drama i used to win speaking competitions 
And so that seed was already within me. And I also came across a quote, which was, within every adversity, there is a seed of equal or greater opportunity. Yes. And I thought that maybe there will be an opportunity. And it's fair to say it was very much little small green shoots to begin with. But I realised I loved people. I was fascinated by people. I was able to put over words in ways that people seem to appreciate. And um, so again, I, I work with people who've been made redundant from British coal, but I wasn't just helping with like CVs or interview techniques. I used to talk about this. And I used to ask a question and I still ask it now. And I say, because remember I operate in a non-church environment. Besides God, if you believe in God, who is perhaps the most important person you're ever gonna talk to? And eventually someone will say, it's yourself. And I say, exactly. So, and it's interesting in, in Romans, Paul talks about be re transformed yes. by the renewing of your mind. mind. And so, so much of my work is about helping people to understand what's going on up here and to get a better relationship actually with themselves and also a great, greater relationship with other people as well. But it's all about what's happening up here. So how do you describe what you currently do who are you? Oh, what do you do? Oh, it's interesting. You get on a very sort of like, if you want to just be, go fairly boring and stand here and say, I'm a speaker, I'm an author, I'm a coach. Um, and I'll often say, look, if you've got a, if your business, if your organisation's got a conference or a leadership away day or a, a, a day just for the team, and you want someone who's going to talk about change, resilience, well-being, self-leadership, but you want someone to kind of not give you some insights, but also some inspiration and practical tools that I can help. But another thing I think about also, and here's one, I planned this. Um, I also say, when you go to a garden sense, when you buy a plant or a bush, it comes with a card. And on this card, it basically says, if you want to get the best out of me, here's how you care for me. And in some respects, what I've been doing for the last 30 plus years is how can people thrive? How can we flourish? How can we deal with the challenges that life throws at us? How can we improve our relationships with others? And, and how can we learn to thrive and flourish? Because actually when you're born, we're not born and taught how to understand ourselves and other people. And when you meet someone, they're not saying, hey, John, if you want to get the best out of me, just read this. And we have to learn, and sometimes it's by trial and error. So I'm trying by my words, my, my spoken words, my written words, the words I speak live to an audience, the, the words I speak via social media with Instagram, Twitter, now even TikTok. I'm trying to help people. How do I get the best out of myself? How do I get the best out of others? Well, and you, how do they get best out of life? You've definitely thrived, you've definitely flourished. And for somebody who struggled academically growing yeah. up, you're a professor yes. at a university. Yeah, I mean, if you question the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and then you now realise, flipping out this guy's a professor, you realise miracles can definitely miracles happen. Miracles can happen. Yeah, so I was... Um, I suppose my brother, who is an academic, he describes me as what you call an outward facing academic. <clears throat> so I, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Chester. Although as someone said to me recently, what you're professor in common sense. And I'm <laughs> yes. like, thanks for your feedback, mum. I was hoping you'd be proud. But um, an outward facing academic is someone who's taking all their learnings, but not doing it in a way to then impress other academics and write lots of papers, but taking those learnings and thinking, how can we make them accessible for people out there? Whatever your age, whatever your background. And you could even argue with a lot of my work, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to have been to university or done well in school. Because for me, every book I write, I'm, I'm hoping they never have to go to a dictionary as to say, what does that mean? So I'm passionate about simplifying things as well and making what I think is is psychology and I'd also say godly wisdom accessible for anybody and everybody. And that's taken me so far to 42 countries. 
I've worked with a premiership football team, but I've also worked in the largest slum area in the whole of Africa, Kibera, just outside Nairobi. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. 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 And I've done some sessions in Kibera. So powerful, powerful and profound opportunities that I've had, I feel privileged. Absolutely. And uh, yes, you have written various books and um, this book, Sumo, which I absolutely love and I read years ago. Um, but before we talk about Sumo, when you decided to write a book, mm -hmm. Publishers wouldn't take it. Oh, it was rejected <laughs> by 13 publishers because Sumo, it can, Sumo, it's a provocative, it's an acronym that stands for shut up, move on. Yes. And the shut up bit is really saying, shh, get off autopilot, take some time out to stop, think and reflect. But why did pause. that not appeal to the 13 publishers? Because they didn't like the phrase shut up. And one of them even said, hey, um, I'm a northerner and I struggle with it. I think sensitive southerners might find it even harder. So 13 publishers said no. And also, John, I wasn't a name. I'm not a celebrity. You've got this quirky, funny looking guy on a unicycle, this acronym SUMO, shut up, move on. I'm a bit of an unknown. And yet one publisher, one, one friend of mine said yeah, to me this. So the 14th publisher. Yeah, my, a friend of mine said this. He'd worked with me. In fact, I'd worked with him in Kibera. And, and done various things in Africa with him. And he said to me, I gen and he's my Christian mentor, and he said to me, Paul, I genuinely believe Sumo could help a lot of people. So I think you need to push more doors. And I said, Paul, I've pushed a lot of doors. And he said to me, well, just try pushing a few more because you only need one to open. It came out, WH Smith decided to make it business book of the month when it came out which is rather strange because it's not a business book. No, but it remained at number one for how many weeks? Well, there was actually another one I did, Self Confidence, yes. was 24 weeks. That one was like business book of the month. You go to airports, railway stations, and you'd got all these other... Alan, Alan Sugar, Lord Sugar, had a book that came out the same time as Sumo. And I have a picture that someone took at Victoria Railway Station of Sumo on the top shelf and a little copy of Alan Sugar's book just underneath it. Um, yeah, again... But again, put perseverance. If yes, you absolutely. you stopped at yeah. 13, whereas you've got to knock on the 14th door. Yeah. And people, and I think sometimes you have to decide, is this just stupid stubbornness or really profound perseverance, if you like? And I think for people listening, going, well, wh which is it? I had people in my world who were saying, no, this is good. I didn't yes. feel, I think, because sometimes I think maybe I've had some ideas and I'm desperately deluded. But there was this sense in which, and I was speaking at events and people were saying to me, Paul, I wish my husband had been here today, or I wish my son or daughter had heard you, or I wish my partner had heard you. You know, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I thought, yes, I have, and I'm not getting much look very far with that. So I had that sense still, it could do something. But it sometimes takes people around you to be your champion and your cheerleader, as well as sometimes your challenger, but I needed some cheerleaders and um, a door opened. Now you're known as Mr. Sumo. Indeed, the Sumo guy. The Sumo guy. Okay, so w where did you coin this phrase? So where did it come? I'm running a coaching and counselling skills course in the early 2000s in Glasgow. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, one of the delegates, I couldn't say it was male or female, said to me, because I didn't know how impactful it would be, they went, well, if all else fails, you can always tell them to sumo. I'm like, what's that? Shut up, move on. The audience laughed, I laughed, didn't think anything any more of it. Next time I'm running that course, I weaved it in as a bit of a joke. And then I started, again, a bit like with my faith, a bit like a lot of things, it evolves. And so I began to talk about we need to shut up our inner critic, move on to listen to our inner coach. And again, more and more happened and people were just liking this phrase. And I had a disparate number of different ideas, if you like. And I, I suppose branding is important. And so this became this umbrella term to describe a number of my different ideas. But what also, you know, I've got this phrase, you know, blessed are the flexible for they shall be successful. Although the shut up bit is because I, I believe it's very easy to live life on autopilot 
and sometimes with a sense of entitlement. And sh shut up is saying, get off autopilot, stop, think, reflect, press pause, and maybe live life more intentionally with a sense of awe and appreciation. See, th the world we live in now, m w people get outraged very quickly, but they don't seem to be as quick to appreciate life and what we all have. And so I am very, very clear on the, the shut up, what it's not meant to be aggressive, but it gets your attention. But it's get off autopilot, let's stop, let's think, let's press pause. And, and, and then maybe move on. Let's not just reflect, but let's move on here. Life is a privilege, whether you have a faith or you don't have a faith. It's an absolute privilege. And I've had to adapt because some people, despite knowing that it wasn't meant to be aggressive, said, yeah, but we're struggling, particularly when we started to do it in schools, so it has an alternative definition. Um, stop, understand, move on. But here is, for me, the mic drop moment. Sumo as a word, not as an acronym, but as a word in Latin, means to choose. Yes. And our choices matter. Our choices have consequences. And a friend of mine, Drew Povey, is a leadership speaker. Uh, he has this phrase, Paul, every day is a choose day. C-H-O-O-S-E. And I suppose what I do in my work, John, is I just give people, I'm not here to give answers or advice but I'm here to give you some insights and to get you to ask and maybe consider some questions. I think I could have this completely wrong. I'm sure I read somewhere that Jesus himself asked over 300 questions. Yes, he did. Over 300. And I think at times we can get into, and I understand the need to, for proclamation, but I guess I'm more of a questioner and getting people to think by asking questions and maybe to create a little bit more curiosity as well about what's what's it all about. Well, Paul, you definitely do create curiosity. You've thrown in some wonderful little gems there, very insightful, and um, I highly recommend this, uh, full of more than just breadcrumbs of wisdom. Paul, an absolute joy to have you on Facing the Canon. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Wow, wasn't that inspiring? I was truly inspired. And the good news is, Professor Paul McGee will be back with us next week for part two. Don't miss it. Join us again next week with Professor Paul McGee. Thank you.